and welcome to Reliving My Youth. My name is Noel Fogelman. My guest this week is Ken Michaelman. Now, Ken portrayed Admiral Goldstein on The White Shadow. Show ran for three seasons, nominated for two Emmys for Best Drama. Probably one of the most influential, if not the most influential sports shows of all time. It dealt with real life issues that shows back then weren't dealing with. Oh, and yeah, the basketball was legit. Ken had an extensive basketball background. He played college basketball for the University of Denver before suffering a very serious injury. And one of his teammates was a very famous comic slash actor. We discussed who that was. But he also coached basketball. He coached AAU basketball in the hood. Ken talks about how that came about. We discussed the state of the NBA. He tells two very funny stories about Rex Chapman and Russell Westbrook. But Ken kind of pivoted from acting and he became a stand-up comic for over a decade. Very funny act that he has. And now he's living in Sweden. He talks about how he landed in Sweden. And one of the roles we talk about was his guest starring role on Police Squad starring Leslie Nielsen, which was kind of the origin of The Naked Gun. Very funny show. He talks about Leslie Nielsen's fart machine. It's a very famous fart machine that he brought on set to prank everybody. Ken shares a great story about that. And I ask him a question that's still hard for him to answer about the White Shadow after all these decades. I really enjoyed my conversation with Ken, and I hope you do as well. So, Ken, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So, uh, what have you been up to these days? How did um, how did a boy from uh, New York City end up in Sweden, of all places? Is that where I am? Let me check. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am in Sweden. Oh, my God, what am I doing in Sweden? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, no wonder I couldn't understand anybody. I've been wondering. Thank you for clarity. That was oh, anytime. Um, yeah, no, no. I I've, I've been in Sweden for a while. That's just what happens when you um, you know, you come for a visit and and a friend puts you on um on an app and you look at your phone and you go, why are seventeen Swedish women asking me out? And he starts laughing and he put a bio on the thing uh, and uh, I don't know, sixteen of them were the women were not overly quick-witted let's put it that way okay. one was very smart you know, i'm not saying she was the hottest if she was here she'd look at me badly but uh right. <laughs> she, she was uh she was fine so we started talking and we had a, a pretend I, I was pretending my shrink was talking to her shrink and it was very funny when I, and finally she said are we ever going to meet and i was here for a little a bit visiting some friends because i had been here before and i said i don't know i don't know and then she said let's go to dinner so we went to dinner at an Indian restaurant, and then we went to dinner again the next night. And I, I just can't get rid of her. I don't know. So I married her, you know, um, and um, and that's how I ended up in Sweden. Oh, that's great. So how long have you been here? I have been in Sweden on and off for about six years. Uh, uh, my wife is a medical person, so. On, on our third date, which was at a Greek restaurant, she said, I want you to teach my class. And I, it's called presentation class. And I said, you want me to teach doctors and researchers from all over the world? I'll kill them. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and uh, I said no for a couple of months. And then I said yes. And it was really fun. And then, because uh, it to me, it was like coaching basketball, which I love and all this stuff. And um, I've been doing that for a while. And uh, I said, this is really cool. After the class, I guess i'm a professor now so when do we get to grade them and then she very calmly explained to me that in europe you don't grade the students they grade you hmm. on one to five stars and then i basically said i would never have done this if i'd known that and uh then we got our grades and they were terrific and uh luckily and then we've been doing it for a while and it's a lot of fun and um, I don't want to toot my own horn. I guess I don't really. It doesn't matter. But we ha evidently, my class had the highest grades ever. It, it's called Karolinska. It's a was what's well, actually ranked the number six medical school in the world, which is frightening that I could be teaching there. Right. But but uh, I make it a lot of fun, and we have a a good time. And the 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 
students, a lot of them are doctors already, are it's a very different system. They're great people and they're incredibly interesting. And they're from all over the world, China, Africa, Sweden, Finland, everywhere, America. Um, so it's a PhD course, basically. And here they can take their PhD much later than we are used to in America. And um, what did you major in? No, me. Uh, I was foolish enough to do broadcast journalism. You know, okay, where I, were you? Where did you go to school? Well, let's I, turn the tables a little bit. Where did you go? To me? Yeah, I, I followed the money, of course, going to broadcast journalism. You know, I uh, went to school up in Buffalo, so you know, worked Which up one? there, uh, Buffalo State University. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So after that, I worked at a local sports station for a couple of years, and then I moved to Connecticut. Worked at ESPN for almost a decade. Fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, they always say don't work at places where you like admire. Like you don't want to know, like, you know, you pull the curtain. You, you, you like fast food. Don't work at a fast food place. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You know, and yeah. So my love affair of ESPN kind of died, you know, quickly after that. But um, yeah, so now I bounced around for a couple places and now I'm at Yahoo. Oh, well, yeah. great. There you yeah. go. And you're living in the West Village, which is East Village, which is really cool. No, I'm, I live in Connecticut still. I still, oh, so I still commute, but right I, now. okay, yeah, got it. I'm actually, yeah. yeah, I'm in my office, so it's like one of the perks. I have a couple Can hours. I just feel the interviewer. It, I'm much more comfortable. We'll, we'll make this segment about you because nobody's ever probably even known about you. I mean, you probably ask all the questions, but you know, really, probably, it's about time you were interviewed. I'll, I'll make a deal with you. You can interview me as long as I can grade you after. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Back to you, of course. Um, right. Was there like a language barrier during these classes for the, the students all over? No, because all the classes are in English. Oh, okay. So, yeah, if it if it had been in Swedish, uh, be in trouble. Forget it. I, yeah. I try to get the Swedish language, and to me, it's uh, it's impossible. I can't right. learn the Swedish language at all. I, other languages I'm better at, but uh, Swedish for some reason does not agree with me. Right. Um, so uh, and. It's a very different society. Uh, basically, I do things a little different. I mean, for instance, I have an invisible dog that I generally take to all the supermarkets when I go. And I'm like, come on, come on. And everybody's <laughs> looking for the dog, of course. Right. <laughs> then my wife will say in Swedish, uh, the dog's invisible. And Swedish people aren't really funny. They don't, <laughs> they don't get it. They don't particularly think it's funny. They, right. they just whistle and get annoyed. Yeah. Which makes me laugh. Right. Of course. Yeah. So uh, it's an odd, odd place to be uh, for me, but it's okay. It's all good, man. It's right. all fun. Life is, you know, I never really would have envisioned this for my life, uh, but you have to go with the flow. Um, and I think it's really important to embrace whatever moment kind of you're in. I know that sounds a little hokey, but it's it's to wherever you're living. And actually, I just bought a place in Spain about two weeks ago. Oh, nice. So uh, we're going to split it. Well, it won't be built for two and a half years. So if okay. I'm still kicking right. in two and a half years, I will be uh, in Spain as well. Um, uh, we'll be about four or five months here and the rest there and whatever. Um, because I have dear friends in Spain and my wife was working there and I was there a couple months ago and my wife said, I want to move to Spain. I think my response was, what? And then I realized I just put the pictures up in the house in Sweden right. uh, for the first time. But okay, fine. We'll move to Spain because if you've ever been to Sweden in the winter, you want to move. It's dark. Right. There's it's light for two hours. It's freezing cold. And uh, I thought, you know what? Let's move. Let's move. Yeah. Let's. In, it's more like L.A. Let's move. Right. <laughs> and the sweet and the Spanish people are fantastic. They're so sweet, so wonderful, and so they laugh at the invisible dog. Let's okay. put it there. Yeah. Well, hopefully you'll find the dog before you move to, to Spain. Well, we have four real ones. I don't see why I would need to find the dog. The dog can follow us. Come that's on. true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, no, so that's basically, that's my life. Everybody has a different life. I mean, you've had an interesting life. Uh, life is full of, you know, every day is, you know, what are you going to do? Right. 
you better have fun with it, right? Yeah. I mean, twists and turns, you have to adapt and it's, it's how you adapt. It's, it's, you know, how, uh, how it makes us and defines us pr- pretty exactly. much. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, some days are good. Some days are bad. I'm not, you know, all days are not good. I'm not here to say that on your podcast that all days are mm-hmm. great. They're not, Yeah. but, uh, but most days are, even the bad ones are interesting. Let's put it that way. It's a lot better to be having a bad day than no day. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Every day you wake up, it's a good day, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So okay. what is, so what's your, okay, good. Yeah, I know you're about to hit me with some weird questions. So oh, no, no, no. You first. You first. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm your pawn. Okay. Go no, I was just going to say, because like, you know, you, you went, you played basketball in college and then you obviously act. So what was the original goal for you? Was it acting? Was it to play, you know, pursue uh, basketball I, further? I knew I wanted to be one of two things. I'll answer you seriously. When I, uh, from five years old, six years okay. old, I either wanted to be an athlete or an actor. Okay. That was it. Uh, I was crippled as a kid. Uh, okay. So I had a very bad accident. I was in a wheelchair from nine, five to nine. Oh, wow. But I would never do sports. So uh, my brother that was one of the best tennis players in the world basically when he was in college and i um i just decided that sports became everything to me because they said i could never do it and uh man i mean i won't lose it anything monopoly tenant it didn't matter what it was i had this thing i was a little bit of a strange kid i refused to lose in anything and as for acting um it's what I always wanted to do from a young age. Um, I was ca- with Cafe La Mama. You're in the East Village, so you must know what Cafe La Mama was. And 15 yeah. years old, it was a very famous uh, theater troupe. I was with them when I was 15, and the youngest member of the company at the time was about 31, besides me. So I would take the train down to Astor Street and uh, rehearse till four in the morning and then come home and go to high school. So it was a, a bit of a strange thing. And my dad then pulled me out when he found out there was all this nudity in, in, in the play I was in. And then right. um, we moved up to Mamaroneck. Okay. Uh, my dad died when I was in uh, high school. So I, I actually finished out high school in a motel and, um, and was acting at the time, doing a lot of commercials at the time, et cetera, et cetera, supporting myself. And, um, then I moved to California when I was 19 uh, and started working a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were playing, we'll kind of bounce around a little bit, you know, play college basketball, University of Denver. And then this, at that point, it was what, still Division Two? Was it Division One at that point? No, they were Division One. Okay. Yeah, they were Division One. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying they were any good, but they were. Yeah. <laughs> they were Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, still play Division One basketball anywhere. That's you, you had to be extremely talented. No, not particularly. <laughs> uh, I was just, uh, you know, lucky. And then I played it. I played at Skidmore College, which right. was Division Three, and and but we had a really good, a fun team. Okay. Uh, played tennis in both places. Um, yeah, that's it. Right. So, but your teammate at Denver was probably was probably one of the greatest actors of our generation, the one and only Sinbad. So his how, name was David Atkins. That's but, right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, didn't even know he was, uh, <laughs> I didn't even know he was Sinbad. Right. Until many years later when a guy named Joey, who was on the team, uh, mentioned it to me. We somehow I ran into Joey and, and I said, he said, Oh, you know, he, uh, David's doing great. And I said, David, David, yeah, David. I said, Oh, great. What is he doing? <laughs> and he said, Well, he's Sinbad. And I went, He, he is. <laughs> So I didn't even realize it. He was uh, right, uh, very thin in college. Okay. He could jump out of the gym, yeah. And uh, he always seemed to me to have a scowl. He was very serious all the time. So the fact that he became sim, I love him when he was on stage. You know, after yeah. that, of course, I watched him, right? And uh, you know, from what I know about him and re- have read about him, because I wasn't close to him in college, he has a big heart, and. Um, you know, his stuff was very good, very funny. And uh, yeah, wish I'd known him better. Yeah. How, how good a player was he? He was good. Yeah. 
he was really good. He he was really really good. He uh he could jump. You know, he was a great athlete actually. Yeah, but you wouldn't know from watching him old, when he was older. He was a really gifted athlete. Yeah. Yeah, because I know he did like a football movie back in like the early '90s, Necessary Roughness. So I remember that one, which was pr- pretty funny. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Where, where did you play in high school ball? Well, I wasn't allowed to play. I played in eighth grade uh, for um, Bald uh, Bentley. Okay. I was the only player that I know of, anyway, to play varsity basketball uh, in New York. And in eighth grade, I was better in eighth grade than I was later. And uh, I broke my leg in the middle of the game. Oh wow! I didn't tell anybody for about ten months because I was scared they would. And sure enough, I went to the same doctor who did the original operation, Doctor Bosworth, and. He was a very nice old man. He walked in. He said, "You're a jerk." He used other language, right? And because I was his Michelangelo, they've taken bone from my femur and put it in my hip for the first time ever, instead of amputation. And um, when I was younger, and he said, "Well, you'll never play uh, any more sports in high school," uh, which I, I I did anyway. I played on the playgrounds, but I wasn't supposed yeah. to, right? As I got a little healthier. And um, then I um, I didn't play all through high school, so okay. I just went to Denver and, and made a team as a walk on, basically, and that was it. Right, well, yep, so, I mean, that's that, it. yeah, at least enough about proved, basketball. Yeah, at least you proved them wrong, right? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. I, you know, got hurt early and right. didn't do much. So, but it was, but it was, uh, I was, I was good for a while. Well, I was good when I was in eighth grade that, that yeah. i could jump higher and was faster in eighth grade i could right. dunk basketballs at once in eighth grade and, and yeah. forget it now i can't even touch the backboard so right yeah you and me both <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah yeah but i mean it, it must have been cool then like to combine your two loves acting and basketball into the white shadow then yeah the white shadow was uh was a good show it really was um a lot of people I think it was a lot of people's favorite show of all time, to be honest. Yeah. And um, I do remember when um, we had the final auditions in front of the network and we had to play ball. And uh, yeah. yeah, so Curtis Jackson, there's a name for you, right? Yeah. Uh, Eric Kilpatrick. And he was called me out in front of the, you know, like, hey, white boy. And I turned around and I went, what do you say? And he, he went, I'm going to, you know, and the network was watching. And then he went up to uh, one-on-one and I just sent the ball back about five rows. And then he whispered to me, hey, man, hey, man, I need this job. And I said, then don't call me white boy. I'll let you score. Yeah. And and I did, but he didn't know I could play. But, you know, Byron Stewart, who played Coolidge, right, is uh, one of my best friends in the world Okay, to this day. And Byron has a heart of gold. He's one of my favorite people I've ever met. He's gone through some medical stuff lately. So he's, you know, he's not quite the same great athlete he once was yeah. uh, from some different things. And, uh, but he, he was fantastic. And he, I think he and I were the, I'm trying to think, I, I would say, I mean, Kevin Hooks could play, but mainly they weren't really basketball players. And, uh, uh, except for Byron and I, and uh, he he was great. Byron was the best player, and he was really um, – he could have gone pro. He had, they had an accident, actually, before the draft, or he would have been drafted, I wow. think, pretty high. Um, but not only was he the best basketball player, I, he was – he's one of the best human beings I've ever met in my entire life, and I love him with all my heart to this day. We We talk all the time. Oh, that's but great. he's the only one I've really kept in touch with. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to, to watch the show? I never watched it when it was on much, okay. to be honest. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, you know, once in a while, I guess I can watch it now, but uh, I don't really know. The answer is probably no. Okay. I don't. All right. Because when I was at ESPN, obviously, you know, ESPN Classic was still, still a thing, and it, they would run that on loop all the time. So that's when I pretty much discovered yeah. it. Not yeah, I mean, I, I was watching, you know, Woj, you know who Woj is? Oh, right? yeah. So I was watching one of his, uh, I, I like him, I was watching his his uh, podcast, and he had the picture, the cast, he has the cast picture in, in his okay. back, 
And that was fun to see. That was recently, actually. I just noticed it. And then I actually uh, sent him a, I tried to get in touch with him and ask him a question, but I couldn't get in touch with him. I didn't know how to do it. So um, I, I don't remember what I did. I think I sent an email somewhere on the internet, never got returned. Oh. Uh, but, uh, but, but I love his analysis and stuff on the game. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I coached very late. I it really, what I really wanted to do was, I think if I could have my life over, I'd yeah. be a coach, I'd yeah. be a basketball coach. And, uh, I loved it. I coached high school. Um, and then I coached, uh, AAU ball okay. in, in the hood right. for, uh, I can basketball a guy named Rockhead Johnson, who was the former head of the Crips. Oh wow! And he's the only white guy for, well, for forever, basically. Yeah. And um, Rock uh, is another guy who was a heart of gold. Although, you know, Rock is as tough as they come. Hmm. And uh, met him for lunch one day through Jim Brown, the football player. I wanted to do a movie on Rock. Yeah. I don't know why I'm telling you this. And uh, met him at a restaurant, and he was very. Hmm. Uh, hesitant and um when i i said he, then he said man you're you're crazy after a while i said i just lost my coach you want to be my coach and i was like you want me to be your coach i said okay i said how long are you gonna let me hug you for and we say goodbye and he said no man i don't i don't hug men motherfucker i hugs women like that right. and i said well i'm a touchy feely jew get up and give me a hug and he did <laughs> and then he whispered uh, don't tell anybody and i said you know no problem he whispered back and then I said, this man needs a hug you know, in the restaurant. He ran out of the restaurant. I thought, what's wrong with this picture? The former head of the Crips is running away from me. But uh, I, I coached for Rock for four years. Okay. Had a great time. Loved it. And uh, we got some a lot of kids, college scholarships. And it was good. It was That's really awesome. good. Yeah. That's awesome. Like, what do you think now about today's game? What do I think about today's game? Are you talking NBA? Are you talking and, college? And It'll start with NBA because it's for me it's unwatchable. Yeah, I think that it's an interesting game. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, first of all, the ball doesn't move enough. You yeah. know, it just it really doesn't move enough. And uh, for me, uh, and I'm watching. I mean, that's it's some teams. The Warriors are better at it than other teams. Uh, but I think that today's game is, is I mean, look, these guys are making so much money, really. And so how important is the coach? Because you, you really see every, all these coaches just, it, it's almost akin to being a teacher in the educational system these days. The students run the colleges, the students run the, the you know. So if, if, a, if, a, if a teacher says something, and a student doesn't like it or a student gets a bad grade, often the teacher nowadays will get fired. And it's a real problem in society. Um, same thing with, with the NBA. I mean, um, you very rarely see, uh, I was watching the, I must say I was watching the Phoenix Clipper series recently. And of course, Kawhi Leonard and George are out. Yeah. But Westbrook played amazing actually. And I, I didn't like him with the Lakers at all. Right. I and, uh, and uh, he, but Tyrone, but Lou coached great. Now they lost, yeah. but he put in that five guard, five guard, uh, complete five guard team in the last quarter, and they almost won that game. And that was really impressive to me that he thought to do that. And then I was a little disappointed that Monty Williams didn't have an answer for that uh, very well. I mean, that's what I think of the game. I just think that it's interesting to watch. Uh, I'm trying to think who I really. There are a couple of coaches I really, I like Monty Williams, but I mean I like the coaches. Yeah. I just don't, and I love watching individual players like Kevin Durant or Booker. They're right. great. Um, probably my favorite players to watch is is Brunson for the Knicks actually because I I just think he makes the team so much better. Yeah, um, great. And I knew that when they. I've been saying that since Villanova. I would. I, I, I yeah. mean, basically, I, I've. I have this talk every year with the draft for the last 20 years to my best friend in, in LA. And he always says, who would you take number one? And I always say who I would take and I would take, and he always goes, you're out of your mind. And then it, but I've been kind of right about all this stuff. Uh, and, and um, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. Don't start me. I could, I could, you right. know, yeah. I, I just could go on and on. 
Yeah, my, my son is a I huge. I think it's okay. The game is interesting. Yeah. College game to me is more interesting, probably. Yes. Because the coaches have more influence. And uh, you can see the most important, I'll tell you one thing, the most important player on the court for me when I would coach was never the star. It was always the glue guy. Right. Uh, the glue guy's it. If you can't find a glue guy, you can't have a team. And it's the same thing in life. If you can't find a glue guy for your life, you're in trouble. There are always going to be stars, always going to be guys who can score a million points, always going to be guys who look great. They usually don't play any D, but they look right. great. But you got to find that glue guy because the glue guy makes a team. Right now, I'm, I'm looking at Phoenix because I, I predicted that they would get Durant 48 hours before they did. Okay. And I told my friends are going to trade four number ones, are going to trade, uh, you know, uh, Bridges, are going to trade Johnson and give up crowd. And, and my same guy, Holland, said, you're out of your yeah. mind. I said, no, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And I bet it like 48 hours, 20 to one. And they said, how did you know that? And I said, because he wanted to go to Phoenix. He wanted to play. It was obvious that they were going to make that trade. So I didn't bet much. I don't bet a lot. Right. I just bet yeah. a little bit. And uh, uh, I look at that team. And the guy they got to have on the court is a Kogi. They just got to have him on the court. I mean, period. I, I, I don't know what Monty Williams is thinking when he plays a guy like that eight minutes. He, that guy's the glue guy for that team. And that's what I mean by a glue guy. Not right. Tory Cook's been good, but you, you really need to have that glue guy. I guess I still watch the NBA, don't I? Look at it seems like it, yeah. Talking seems about like the a, NBA. Yeah, uh, casual observer, seems like. <laughs> which I've been, yeah, like I said, I, I really think I coaching for me was the best. Yeah. That was the most fun thing I've ever done. And I can't help it. I, I can't help but dissect every game I watch. I can't help but think what would I have done in that situation. Now I'm just an old fogey watching the game, but yeah. but uh, I loved coaching. I loved when I worked with Rock and finding these kids and and who were unheralded because he took. I didn't coach their elite team, which all the blue chippers. Right. I coached the 16s and 17s, but we always beat the elite team every scrimmage. And Rock would always go, "How do you how do you beat me?" And I go, "I don't know. I guess I'm just lucky." Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of fun. Wow, don't start me. I'll, I'll just keep talking about basketball all day long. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Absolutely. My biggest complaint now about the game is it's an outside game, and they just shoot three-pointers, and that's really it. There's no more inside presence. The physicality is gone, and it's 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 a real shame. It's a shame. The center is the least important. Yeah. You know, the center is the least important. Uh, now the wings are the most important, which I, I disagree with. I still think the point guard's the most important, but everybody says be, the yeah. wings. I will say one thing. The dumbest trade I've ever seen in my life was, was I don't understand, either Danny Ainge is a genius or the guy he made the trade with is just should be fired immediately. I said it right. How do you give up all that for Rudy Gobert, who is totally, you know, Rudy Gobert, He's an okay player, yeah, but he's nothing more. He was exposed in the playoffs two years ago when when they would pick off him and he he get you know he would simply um had to guard he would have to guard a, a guard because of the pick and roll. He could never guard a guard. He could every play he was exposed. Yeah. So the defensive player of the year and put him on a smaller guy and he was not even good. To, sorry if you're listening, Rudy, but. You know, and then to give up all of what they gave up Minnesota for him. I don't know who the Minnesota GM was, but uh, hmm. I don't. I don't know. This is what I, th I thought it was pretty. Uh, yeah, pretty egregious. I, I. But I agree with you. It's a three point shooting, three point shooting through. I mean, it's exciting. A game like last night where Trey Young, who I, I had my qualms about, but right. when he when he made that shot at the end there. Yeah. And he had Brown going on his, you know, that was pretty going backwards. That was, that was exciting. I do, however, think Trey Young is the most overrated player in the game. And if I were coaching the Atlanta mm -hmm. Hawks, I, I, I would have traded him before the trade deadline and I would right. have turned the team over to Murray. So, because you could have got a lot for him, but last night he was great. So yeah. he's really talented. Right. I mean, yeah. 
there's certainly a place in the game for the shot. I mean, you know, I'm not saying you abolish it altogether, but when you just have like big guys, I remember like back in the nineties, like Charles Oakley, if he took a three pointer and made it, that was the worst thing because he wouldn't stop trying to shoot. Absolutely. That's not, that's not his game. Get, you know, get in the box. Oh right. yeah. Guys, you look like Eric Gordon, you know, Eric yeah. Gordon, he loves to shoot the three, he, right. you know, it's the worst thing for his team. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Russell Westbrook loves to shoot the three. If I'm if yeah. I'm guarding Westbrook, I let him shoot the three all day Absolutely. long. Stay out know? there. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead and make twenty nine percent. Yeah, you know, I don't care. I mean, right. because it'll it's proven that you you're not going to win the game for a guy shooting twenty nine percent. But from again, it's also been proven that three point shooting is the way cyber genetics, you know, whatever to. Yeah, cyber genetics. What, did I just say cyber genetics? Cyber genetics. <laughs> yeah, uh, are, it, it, but it is true that three point shooting. If you look at the stats, it is the quote unquote best way to win the game, which is a shame. I, I look at a guy like um, uh, go back to Phoenix. Look at you. Look at Aiden, and I'm thinking, yeah. why? Why didn't he destroy that lineup? In the fourth quarter, why didn't they just feed him low and pick and roll him and pick and roll him, yeah. or just put him down on the post, put him down at, at, at the and, and let him go to work? Because he's very talented, but he got. I don't understand why, but I guess maybe you don't want to trade two points for a three point opportunity every time. No. Um, I don't know. I miss uh, I miss the old game just like you do. I miss yeah. the battle to the side. I miss Bob Lanier. I miss uh, all those guys, those unheralded guys that I used yeah. to love to watch play. Uh, Willis Reed, Bob Lanier, I could go on forever. Uh, it was so much fun. Forget the Chamberlains and the Russells and all those guys, but I'm talking about the secondary guys who were so much fun to watch. Um, but you're a basketball fan, clearly, and you've been watching your whole life. So, yeah, you feel yeah. me, and you. Yeah, it's, it's a shame because I haven't really watched as closely as I used to. You know, my son's a huge fan. He's a Mavericks fan. He's he's, he's he's eighteen. And he, obviously he was devastated about uh, Brunson going to the Knicks because, you know, he wanted him. And he's a big Luka Doncic fan. He named our dog Luka and everything <laughs> like that. And, you know, he, he still ha- needs a running mate because he's one of the best players in the world. And they haven't really Luka? found him. Yeah, Luka? yeah Luka well, and they that was when player. I told you about my best friend, that was the, the big argument we had when the Atlanta Hawks uh, drafted Luka and then traded him for Trey Young and a number one. Yeah. I said, that's the worst trade in history. Yep. And he said, what are you talking about? Luke is a, a white guy who can't run. And I said to my my best friend, his name is Holland. Yeah. I said, Luka Doncic will be in the NBA the moment he stops playing. He's going to be one of the greatest players of any generation. Yep. He's, uh, he, he said, oh, he's slow. I said, his mind is so much faster than the rest of the guys. Yeah. He's not slow. He takes his time. He knows how to put a guy in his shoulder. He knows how to do it. That's not slow. No. He plays the game at his pace. Everybody else is trying to play fast, but they can't play fast. Yeah, that's a great player. Um, I mean, Walt Frazier used to do that in a way. I mean, I'm not quite the same level, but right. Uh, no, Luka Dantage is amazing. Um, the guy they traded for, as talented as he is. Uh, I never would have traded for. No, I mean I'm I'm a Nets fan, so I'm glad that he was gone. Yeah, you know, I mean, basketball off and on the court, you know, stuff aside, but yeah, it's it's they haven't found the the right guy. Whether it's Porzingis, who you know he's just yeah, Porzingis is an interesting player, but I agree with you. Um, I I just don't know if I would have traded for a guy who's convinced the world is flat. I just don't know that I ever could have done that. Um, you know. But, uh, as, it, it, I, and I think his best moments were in Uncle Drew. Agreed. Uh, great movie. He's fantastic in Uncle Drew. Yeah. But, you know, he's got a great handle. Somehow yeah. he doesn't make the rest of the team better. Ever. No, he doesn't. And that's what you look for in a player. Who makes a team better? Um, it's the same thing in life. Who are your friends? Do they make you better? Yeah. Uh, it, it's exactly it, it, the parallels are. You, you can go into a metaphor whenever you want, but the parallels are there. They're real. Um, and the guy's never made a team better. No. I mean, Kyrie Irving has never, I've never seen him make any team better. Uh, I'm not sure Russell Westbrook makes a team better, even though he's so talented, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah. Although I've been very impressed with him. Um, with, I thought I was, I've been impressed with the Clippers. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, you want to hear, uh, no, I shouldn't say this. I'll go for it. Why not? No, no, I'll go for it. Look at you. Yeah. Be controversial. <laughs> yeah, it's just a podcast. Nobody no one's knows. listening. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's listening. No, I, I remember I was in Las Vegas and I played, used to play a little poker and yeah. this many years ago and a guy came to me and said, Hey, Russ wants to meet you. And Russ was playing in the big section, you know, three steps up and he was playing for a lot of money. And I said, uh, yeah, Russ knows about ICANN. He used to, you know, he knows, he knows and wants to meet you. Yeah. And this is, I'm Russ's best friend. So I said, okay. So we went up three steps and Russ was in the middle of a poker hand. So okay. I said, well, wait, 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 let him finish the hand. And he never looked at his cards. Do you know how to play Texas Hold'em? Yeah. So he never looked at his hold cards. And he raised 10,000 blind. He was laughing. And these guys had hundreds of thousands on the table. Right. And I'm watching this, and, and and then some guy raised him, then another guy made a three bets, and then Russ, uh, I don't know if he capped it or whatever. There was six figures before the flop on the table. And then he never looked at his cards. The flop was, uh, it was, uh, I think it was the queen of diamonds, the ten of diamonds, and the nine of diamonds. And Russ never looked at his cards. Wow. And then... Somebody bet huge, another guy raised, and Russ said, I'm not looking at my car. I don't care. I raised. And I'm like, what? And it, it, so there was so much. It's the biggest pot I've ever seen. Finally, on the turn, yeah. Russ says, I better look at my cards. <laughs> and he looks at his cards. He had the king of diamonds, and he flopped a straight flush. Okay. Jeez. But he never looked at his cards. So he looks at his cards and he starts going, oh, wow. And, and I'm like thinking, what could the, what could he possibly? And he goes all in and he gets called by two players. And then he turns it over and the guy goes, hey, and, you know, he's it was a big whatever celebration. And he goes, oh, Russ wants it. And I said, no, that's OK. And I walked away. I, I just I didn't want to meet anybody who put in like four hundred thousand dollars. Right. cards. I just decided I'm better off. You know, I'm going to go have a sandwich. So. <laughs> It was a very funny moment for me. I'm happy he won. Yeah. But I remembered that hand. And I remember thinking, I wouldn't trust my team to a guy who does it. I mean, and, and I wondered, I wonder if you talked about today's game. I wondered if this guy, and I have nothing against Russell Westbrook. I think he's great, by the way. Um, I think he's a great athlete and I wish him all the best. But I wondered how how is this guy going to hold on to his his money if he's gambling yeah. like that and now he probably has done great he's probably a really smart guy everything i've read about the guy since then is positive he gives a lot to charity he cares a lot so i don't know i mean yeah. he's probably one of the finest human beings ever but i just i remember seeing that hand and i was so freaked out by yeah. it that I didn't even want to stay in the casino. I just had to get out yeah. and get there. And I didn't really want to meet him. I just didn't. Um, it, it remind you know, it just was a strange thing. I'm trying to think of the Kentucky player, the great. Uh, he was uh, and he got in a lot of trouble, and now he's working. I think he's working for ESPN again as a commentator. Mm. Um, he does. Uh, he's always on social media um oh rex chapman rex chapman yeah 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 i remember rex chapman when i was in an elevator and i heard these two little kids laughing behind me and i turned around and i was like so you up or down to the little kid the kid went what and i said come on i know a gambler when i see one he was like five i said come on what's your secret and i heard the parents laughing from behind but i i never looked up yeah and then i looked up and it was rex chapman and i, I was this is, I think White Chatham might have been on TV even then. And I said, Oh, I, I know you. And he said, I know you too. And he, I, I said, He said, I love watching your show, man. Are you? And I said, Oh, thanks, man. You know, whatever. And left. And he had just signed that huge contract, 30 something million at the time, and um, came down later. And he was playing blackjack, but he had all five uh, seats and they roped it off. Yeah. And he said, Ken, Ken, like this. And I came and there were literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in chips on the table. And he, he, he goes, go ahead, and he throws me a stack that must have been $30,000. Go ahead and play, man. Anything you win, you can keep. And I I looked at and everybody's watching because it was all roped off, and I said, no, that's uh, that's okay, man. I'm going to I'm gonna pass, yeah. uh, but I wish you luck, and I just walked away. And 
I just didn't want any part of it. And then I read what happened to him and I'm happy right. he's back yep. and doing well. Absolutely. But I mean, it was the same kind of feeling. I, I've never told these stories to anybody really that, especially I'm, with a microphone on, right. but yeah, I thought the same thing about Rex Chapman at the time. How's this guy? Got, and he didn't. No. So, um, but he's, he's done well. Uh, I'm happy for him and I hope he continues to do well. Yeah. You know, really, uh, I'm rooting for these guys. Right. Both yeah. of them. Rex yeah. Chapman, Russell Westbrook, uh, both great athletes. Rex Chapman was a great athlete. I, mean, I loved watching Rex. He was, you know, oh, he was amazing yeah. when, when he went up to shoot with that vertical and exactly and he released it at the top of, of his, you know, it was yeah. incredible. And yeah. Yeah. Um, he had some good battles with Jordan players. too. Yeah. Yeah. Great players. I mean, um, yeah. But nobody, listen, nobody, we're, one thing that connects all of us is we're all human beings. Even the guys are gods athletically. Right. Yeah. And uh, you still have to deal with the real part of life. And some do it better. I mean, obviously, Russell Westbrook seems to be doing it pretty well. Russ Jackman didn't do it very well for a long time. And then now he's doing better. Um, he seems like a very insightful guy. Uh, we all make mistakes. And, and that's part of being human. Yeah. We all all fall yeah like, anybody yeah. tells you they have never fallen is lying right the problem is like these hey here's uh here's the doggies oh nice <laughs> yeah uh, they just came back from a walk oh they're so the, cute the big one is uh, this guy here i know that your audience can't see it but this guy here we rescued from la he was alone in the oh uh, he was with a pack of wild dogs in the in the forest and they said he was great dane and black lab but we had the right. dna done he's 20 percent wolf oh wow <laughs> He's a really, he's a sweetheart. Oh, okay, I'm nice. sorry. What were you oh, saying? Oh, no, no, that's great. Um, it's now strapped with dogs. I love dogs. Um, I'm going to say these kids, even like when they're like 9, 10, 11 years old, are told that they're great and they're, they're entitled. So then they go through the ranks with really no like repercussions. And they when they make it to the NBA or NFL, whatever sport, they feel like they can do no wrong. And right. like lose the money, whatever, get in legal trouble. Not, it's not a problem. And there's really no support system for these for these kids. No, there isn't. Shame. And that's the thing. I agree with you. And that's, look at the the tragedy of the Raider receiver, you know, the guy who, yeah, you know, or, or we could pick 20 other tragedies, right? Um, I was just reading a story about uh, Amelia Bates, or whatever his name is, you know, who was heralded to be the next Jordan and, and yeah. got in trouble and then played for, I think it was Eastern Michigan and did okay. I hope he settles down, but it's really hard because, you know, these people, they usually have entourages hanging on to them. And then right. they, because they're huge, because they're successful, because they're whatever, doesn't mean they're not scared. And that's the problem that the public views them as supermen. Right. But... I, I guarantee you, when you get behind closed doors, nobody's a superman. No. And um, uh, I've coached some great athletes. As a matter of fact, one of the kids I did coach from a little Jewish school, um, Orthodox Jewish school a few years ago, and he's a great kid, by the way. And uh, I love him and talked to him recently. He's uh, this Jewish school had maybe Valley Torah was the name of it. He um we coached two years there. He had um hmm, let's see, the school probably had two hundred kids maybe in it. And he's now in the G League. Oh, oh okay. Ryan Terrell. Yes, yes. And uh, you know, I'm hoping he makes it. He's right. a wonderful kid, fantastic player, um great shooter. Uh he's got his head on straight, I think. And uh, maybe he'll make it. He wants to be the first Orthodox Jewish player ever to play in the NBA. You probably know the story. Yes. And uh, he and I would have some great shooting matches. He will tell you that, you know, he won them all, but he didn't. <laughs> right. I, I won half of them. I was the only guy who could beat him on the team. And uh, I beat him half the time. He beat me half the time. And then we'd, we'd wrestle or whatever. I have videos. It was funny. You know, I love the kid. And yeah. uh, I'm hoping he makes it. And um and I think he will. Yeah, we um, he, he still did great. 
Right. Well, I was at my friend's house, was it last year? Or at my wife's friends and her daughter, is, they're Orthodox. And uh, she was watching a live stream of the Shiva game and, you know, he was playing it. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And I, I think they were still undefeated at that point. They had the, like the big winning streak still. And yeah, he was lighting it up from everywhere. Oh, he led the nation yeah. in scoring. Yeah. 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 He's, uh, but I like to think I helped a little bit. Right, I'm sure you did. Yeah. And is this and is that he's, he, he, one thing about Ryan, he'll, he'll play until he's dead on the court. I mean, right. He he's and he's not selfish for the most part, although that was something he had to learn. But we, we went through this with uh, the big tournament once, and right. um, I think I won't go into the whole incident, but I think he really benefited from it. Where he he was playing selfish in this one game that we lost, it was a big game, and uh, we actually had a whole in the hotel, uh, the whole team. And we had a great talk about it. And I think that he he was great during the talk, too, as was his teammates. And uh, it was one of those moments, you know, where you're teaching and you're teaching kids. And I think he took it really to heart. And I think that particular talk was very instrumental in his development. That's, That's all I said about it. But it was really, right. really great. And uh, I'm proud of him. I love the kid. And... Uh, uh, very proud of him. Right. Uh, that's great. That's great. Let me ask you one question about the shadow real quick. Before, <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously the way the show was handled couldn't be made today. I, I don't think that there's not really a lot of high school sports shows out there, you know, like, you know, in the last 40 year thing, Friday Night Lights probably was the other one comparable to, to the shadow and, you know, just the language or anything like that. Did you ever take any of that to like heart? I know it was in the script, but like you being the only white guy on the team and stuff like that. I know, like you, you said in the rehearsals, you took the white boy, but once cameras were rolling and everything else, that did that kind of carry over like after after shooting? What do you mean by carry over? Be like, you know, just like them like kind of ribbing you and stuff like that, or just because okay, well, I'll be honest. Black you know, team. The, uh, somebody's at the door, they can hear the big dog barking. Uh, <laughs> What was difficult for me about White Shadow in terms of character was simply because uh, my character was, yeah. sorry about the barking. That's all right. <laughs> the, um, uh, let's put it, I started the first six games uh, that we did, and then the network called and said, get the white guy off the court. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that pissed me off. Right, because it's uh, ridiculous. And then the episode we had with the Harlem Globetrotters and whatever, I was always made to be um, the joke. And so I, I will tell you that the very first day that we shot, I was ready to go on the, the floor. I opened the doors. I'm a young actor. And I had on what I used to wear in the playgrounds of New York. I had on different colored shoelaces. My mm -hmm. boxers were under my shorts, you know, the whole bit. I was yeah. a good player. And I took a look out there and everybody looked just like me, you know, wardrobe wise. Right. So I didn't go out. I went back to the bathroom and I took white shoelaces and I put on the white shoelaces. I put on, I took off the, the, uh, boxers. Yeah. I took off all the colored wristbands that I had on. And I decided right then I had to be different. Yeah. because otherwise as an actor I was going to get lost and then I went out I, I've often wondered if I just kept the persona that I had of the tough guy uh, yeah. it might have been better for me um, but I had I played the role that I thought was correct for the team Yeah, and um, it always crushed me that I couldn't be better on camera that they wouldn't let me show right. my stuff on camera that I had to be the guy who was the worst player instead of the guy who it was really the best or the second best. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I hated that. Uh, it was, it felt like a real team where they benched me and I couldn't get off the bench. So I, my mother once said, why are you hunched over and walking like that, that guy you play on TV? And I, so I became the character. I, I actually became okay. the character a little bit yeah. in real life. And when my mom said it, I was like, Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Cause I wasn't like that in real life. Yeah. Um, 
So that, yeah. So that's to answer your question. I hope okay. I did. No, you did. That's, that's very insightful. Uh, yeah. Now, how was uh, working with Ken Howard? Because like, you know, Ken, Ken fine. actually, you know, you, know, uh, I, you know, Ken Howard was, uh, was Ken Howard. He was fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was uh, older and right. uh, more experienced than all of us. It was right. That way. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And then one more shout out question. When you found out that they were going to kill Curtis Jackson, what was the reaction to that? That's a darker question. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That's, I, I don't really know how I want to answer that. I, I was very disappointed how they handled it. Right. That's all I'll say. Okay. Uh, didn't like it. Um, they could have handled it a lot differently. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, ends on a lighter topic. You did some stand up after. Yeah, I've done a lot of stand up the last yeah. 10 years. I loved it. Uh, have you ever watched any of it? Yeah, I watched it. It's, 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 it's pretty funny. I actually oh, enjoyed thank you. it a yeah, lot. It's a yeah. different kind of act. I tried to be. Uh, you probably saw the one where I did scenes with the audience, I would yes. assume. Yeah. yeah, I did a lot of different acts, uh, but that one was fun. And um, the audience seemed to really twig to it. It was a very different kind of thing. I would get up on stage and say that comedians are taking all my jobs. So I'm just here to take some time back. And it was I loved it. I, I've done stand up in Sweden. I've done stand up in all through New York. And um, yeah, my it was a lot of fun. I wish I would been able to take it other places let's put it that way right. i did it in Vegas, I, but i but i want i would rather if, i loved it i love stand-up stand-up's a lot of fun and uh yeah that's great and then i don't want to ask you about the brady's but i'll i'll <laughs> please don't. That for another time uh <laughs> yeah. but um people remember naked gun that came actually from the tv show police squad you know it was yeah, that was show. great uh, he was fantastic. That was a fun, fun time. He had a, I will tell you, Leslie Nielsen had a fart machine. I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm, my first day, uh, hello, 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 blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm standing there um, and Leslie Nielsen comes over to me and he's like, you know, <laughs> and I look at him. I don't want to say anything because he's Leslie Nielsen. Right. To me. And I, I nodded figured he had a bad lunch and I walked around the stage. I didn't know everybody was watching this. And then he appears next to me five minutes later and the farts were unbelievable, all different sounds. And I'm, I looked at him like, hi. And then I walked all the way around to the other side of the stage and he's next to me again, five minutes later. And he does a concert. And I finally just turned around and I said, what the fuck did you have for lunch? <laughs> and he started laughing and everybody started laughing. And then I realized it, it was a thing. I heard a story that his ex-wife, uh, his wife at the time said, if you don't give that up, I'll divorce you. And evidently he didn't. And she did. But he was a wonderful guy. Right. Uh, he was a very nice man. And he had this obsession with his fart machine. And, you know, God bless him. Yeah. He was a good guy. Yeah. And you got to play a little basketball in the episode, too. I did. Yes. Yeah. As, a, as a character. It was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. He was a very nice man. There have been, you know, a lot of nice people I've worked with in my life. I would say that Alan Alda was probably one of the greatest yeah. people I've ever known. So a, a lot of fun things. Yeah. That's great. Well, this was fantastic, Ken. Go take out your wife for dinner. Yeah, she's I'll really go. mad at yeah. me. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I really appreciate this. Look, you're a very nice man. And thank you for the time. And uh, I wish you all the best. And a special thanks to Ken for joining me today. And if you have a guest suggestion, you can hit me up on Twitter at the personal one nine. Or like the page will be my youth on Facebook. You can go to iTunes, check out all the past episodes we've had. While you're there, please rate me through the show. Don't have iTunes? Not a problem. Shows on SoundCloud, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music. Basically, wherever you can find a podcast. A new episode comes out eh, every weekish. Uh, stay safe, everybody. We'll see you then. <laughs>